Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the 30 or so people we've got with us. Um, good morning, good evening, good good, good afternoon from wherever you're from. Um, episode 79 here, and we are really excited because okay. this is Craig's and I and my favourite topic to talk about, um, which is running shoes. I don't know that an hour is going to be long enough, um, but we are super delighted to have uh, Doctor of Physical Therapy, Matthew Klein, joining us. Thanks uh, from, from California. So thanks, Matt. Really, really excited. And um, for those of you that may not know of Matt, uh, just a really brief bit of a, a sort of background on him. As we already said, Doctor of Physical Therapy. Um, no slouch as a runner himself. I'm just glancing down at his PBs here. They are enviable. Uh, you know, a 1445 5K, a 3136 10K, a 71 minute half marathon. I'm just going to stop reading them because they're depressing for a very average runner like myself and, and like Craig, but hey, yeah, he, hey, he, hey, the guy can run a bit, there's no denying, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, the guy can run, Let, let's just say, you know, doctor of physical therapy, he, he can absolutely run, and uh, founder of the uh, uh, Doctors of Running blog, which Craig and I are big fans of, and you should go and check it out, Craig's going to put a link to it, um, it's a blog, they've also just started doing round table uh, reviews of shoes on Zoom, which, uh, you know, is definitely something I, I'm loving tuning into as well, so go and check it out, and um, maybe we'll start actually uh matt if it's okay just with a bit of a background on doctors of running because i know it, it was your thing and you sort of kicked it off but since there uh, since it began nathan and david have joined in you're like a team of three now give yeah. us a, a bit of the brief backstory of doctors of running if you don't mind so this started long ago and was partially inspired by people including craig actually who uh i was reading his uh, running research junkie for years and then also uh, by Pete Larson's uh, run blogger. And as a someone who's been involved in the shoe world for a long time, both even when I was in doing my undergraduate study, studies, when I went into PT school, um, footwear was always really interesting to me because I wanted to know what I was putting on my feet and why. I didn't hear the why question a lot. And people just say, oh, you just wear this because of this, right? You just, you wear this shoe because you have this much pronation. And then as I started looking at the research going, that doesn't, no, that's not how that works. And you know, we've known that for a while. And I started asking the bigger questions of why am I putting on this, this on my foot? What shoe works best for each person? It, it does anything work best for each person or is it there's kind of a variety? So the website really started as a way to for me to kind of express my thoughts on kind of what was on the what was out there in the industry, but also really to get people to start questioning and thinking a little bit more about what they're putting on their feet and why. Because there's also a lot of stuff out there. Advertising, marketing is really powerful. Most of the stuff that's marketed and advertised is usually has very little evidence behind it. So I want to be able to kind of get provide some evidence out there and really get people to think. So originally it was called Klein Runs DPT as being a you know doctor of physical therapy. Um, and then we shifted to doctors of running just because in the United States, everybody says we're, we're doctors of physical therapy. There's this big push in the in the uh, in the profession to be referred to as doctors. That to me, that's not something that's that's important to me. That being a clinician is the most important part, and being able to help patients is far more important than what my title is. So please do not call me Doctor Klein during this. Um, <laughs> I do not like that. Uh, I'm working on a PhD, and even when I have that, I'm not going to let people call me that because I want people to to look at me as a human being. But it was inspired by the profession to go. Oh, so doctor of physical therapy. What if, what if we said doctors of running as in that was our research and that's actually ironically what my phd is becoming um is in footwear and, and now analyzing the effects on the human body and there's not as much research out there as we would like so the website again i wanted i realized as i went through residency and fellowship and was barely surviving and trying to keep this thing alive knew that if i really wanted to grow it i was going to have to bring on some good people um david also is a graduate from where i graduated from pt school so i met him was able to get help him get his running back going and got him uh, involved in shoe testing. And then Nathan was somebody, a phenomenal physical therapist I met uh, while I was doing my fellowship program at Kaiser through uh, Dr. Chris Powers down at USC. We had several classes with him and I met Nathan multiple times and said, this guy is awesome. Like, I would love to have you on. And he has just been so phenomenal in mark like PR stuff and getting us in contact with new companies. And it's been a really fun journey having the two of us on. And as you guys know, a team works best. So it's growing and it's that's that's the story so we just keep pushing yeah. it i was going to ask you guys what your secrets were to getting all the free shoes because I, I don't still get as many as i'd like but and um, what i love about nathan is nathan's yeah. very modest nathan's incredibly modest i know you and you and david are, are rapid and nathan mm -hmm. sort of refers to himself as the, the the sort of conduit for the more sort of everyday runner he's more sort of relatable but i've seen some of his times Dude, that's no changing really quick <laughs> he is not going to be able to say that for that's longer because his times are coming down um, quick 
Yeah. But yeah, yeah, that's yeah. His, um, that's his his saying. He's like, oh, I'm the at, you know, I'm trying to like bridge the gap with the average runner, and I'm like, uh, you yeah. better stop running faster, man. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely quicker than average. Um, so. We're just going to talk shoes for an hour. Anyone All right. Sounds anyone that's good. Watching, if you've got questions, um, comments, you know, if you want to ask Matt anything mm -hmm. while we're live, just ping them in and Craig will, will bring them up. But we'll just we'll just talk about shoes until someone has something to say. And what I wanted to start with is the way you guys sort of systematically review and appraise shoes. So when you guys pick up a shoe and you seem to all have a, a fairly reasonable, similar methodology for doing it, right. Right? could you just talk us through the things you look for, the, the things you think matter, the things that don't matter, um, just to give people a bit of a feel for if, they, if, you're, if they're appraising a shoe, where should they start? Right. So, I mean, one of the first things I think people should appraise is don't worry so much about how it feels in your hands. You have to put that on your foot. And the first thing you should be looking for is what is the initial fit like in today's world shoe you shouldn't have to spend that much time breaking shoes in right you know 15 20 years ago when materials were stiffer and they were manufacturing was different was not quite the same it breaking in was normal now you should be able to put that thing on and it should feel good right there immediately if you're feeling these weird bumps and things like that that's probably not optimal now i say this with an asterisk sign behind what i just said because the, all of us have to go through this right when a company sends us stuff we have we got to put miles on it because it's part of honoring them sending this to get a get a review and that means getting a certain miles in we don't necessarily agree with every single shoe that that comes our way just because every shoe is going to work differently for diff each person but we do our best to get as this the criteria number of miles in which i think is really important for the website we have to get i have set a standard that they get everybody get at least 35 to 75 miles on every single pair of trainers and at least 15 to 20 miles on racing shoes just because i want people to know hey we've put their, these through their paces and we've got the mileage we know how this feels but the fit is probably the first part and that that's number one because we know from a lot of the research right that you know pronation that kind of the, like arch support and things like that have not been as consistent with going can we prevent injuries as this in this manner it's really going how comfortable the shoe the comfort paradigm which you know dr ben oneg and all those guys have been putting out a lot of good stuff on um it's really true if a shoe's not comfortable that probably you're probably going to change lots of things to get around that so fit how it feels on your foot is the first part now we have it stratified into fit ride stability all these things just because that's our way of trying to be systematic about it because i am i am a musician previously so i i am very improvisational right i play the scottish fiddle irish stuff so i am all over the place with that so the the systematic approach that we have allows helps me stay a little bit on track but the fit is is number one and then obviously how does it go how does it feel on the run right how's that ride how does each part of the foot feel the forefoot midfoot heel and then following that is how does it feel as you start taking it on different terrain or different speeds and asking yourself, how stable is this when you move different ways? How stable is each part of the shoe? What does stability mean to each person? Because we now know that that comes from many different parts, not just from a uh, post or reg. There's a lot of ways to do that. So yeah, and then after that is just trying to keep it simple, not get too complicated, right? Because our thoughts as a DPT section is really our thoughts as those looking from a research and a biomechanical standpoint. So it's not really specific to any one profession, although as, as obviously as all of us are physiotherapists, right, we're gonna have a little bit of bias in that. But it's really looking at the, bi the biomechanics, how is this gonna affect your foot, what you should be aware of, what you shouldn't, shouldn't be aware of, looking at the, the current research and going, you know, is, does this matter or not? So yeah, that's kind of how we, in a nutshell, how we yeah. evaluate it. Sure. Can I just ask a question, Matt? The, this, yeah. One, one thing that it's always, sort of intrigued me is this whole concept of ride. Yeah. And I know Ben and Nick's group have tried to come up with an operational definition of it to to use that definition yeah. in research. Um, and I mean, how, how, how do you, how would you define ride? What do you, when, when you say ride, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, all, all kudos to that group. It's not till yeah. doing this PhD that I realized how hard it is to actually create an operational definition because you can't measure something unless you define it. And then mm. good luck after that, because how do you measure <laughs> rides? So it is a very personal thing. And that's why we have like each one of us kind of has different preferences. So at the very bottom of each review, it kind of gives, we try to give a little background on each person go, hey, this is what we typically, I typically like firm riding shoes, right? D David and Nathan, David typically likes a little bit of softer shoe, but more responsive. Nathan seems to be able to handle 
excuse me, a variety of things. So it's really person dependent, right? We are each three people and unique. Yeah. So that's going to, that's going to totally vary on each person. So ride to me is looking at how does the shoe transition? What's the cushioning like? Is it responsive? Is it not responsive? Um, and there is as, as objective as I try to, as I try to be, honestly, it comes down to a subjective, mm. um, report to be totally honest. Yeah. I think that, that, that study I just put up from, from, yeah. you know, next group. That's a, a great there's study. A, yeah. There's this comment here in the, in the abstract that says, however, it was not always the shoe with a softer midsole that had a smoother ride as five out of the 13 participants had a smoother ride in the stiff midsole. Right. <laughs> so it's and that's. Of, and then there's always the, the the other factor that gets thrown in there is how is our bodies doing at that point, right? So if yeah. I go test a shoe after like certain hard workouts, my I know that my initial reaction is going to determine a lot of how I feel about the shoe, even if it's not true. Like if I'm extra fatigued, if I have a bad run in it. So there, it's it is when you ask that question, it is very hard to quantify that, right? We do our best, right? Going, okay, what's the transition like to us? How's the cushioning at each, each part? Is a stiffness, but it, it is challenging when you start asking about like. How do we quantify yeah. this? Well, that's this is yeah. exactly what you see the comment there that Bruce just yeah. made. Yeah, how can we? And I think that's what Ben O'Neill was trying to do was to try and yeah. come up with an operational definition that actually could be used in research and to quantify it. Right. And I, I, yeah, and obviously, what's a good ride for you is not going to be a good ride for me. No. <laughs> yeah, and that's why I try to like say like, hey, remember that I like really firm riding at shoes. So just mm -hmm. when when you read something of mine, you have to figure out is is your body similar to mine? And that's what we try to be as objective as possible, mm. right? But just, mm. it's hard. It's hard with this stuff, describing yeah. this. That's an awesome question. Yeah, but I think- While, yeah, while we're talking about, um, sorry, Craig, while we're talking no. about uh, Nick's team, can we mm. just talk, get, get your take on comfort? Because we've, we've definitely got some people who are, are now hanging out in the camp that as long as something's comfortable, you're, you're good to go, you're golden. Is it that simple, do you think? I don't think anything is that simple. I mean, it's the same thing as like how, like, can you make for like, you know, it, for treating the foot and ankle, right? With injuries, can you make blanket statements? No, not. I mean, if you look at even the research that attempts to make blanket statements, it always comes out inconclusive just because it depends. That's the answer. My students at APU who have, I'm uh, doing some uh, teaching assisting and assisting uh, like teaching stuff right now, they hate me when I say it depends. But as a couple of them have started to go out in the clinic, not so much right now, obviously, with the whole situation. Um, but now they understand. It does depend. It depends on the person, right? There, It's not just, I don't think it's as simple as, is it comfortable or not? There's other factors that go in there. But that should be something that's important, right? You shouldn't have a shoe mm -hmm. on that feels terrible. Yeah. But I think the other yeah, thing that, that I've noticed is that when you, and, and I know even some of the research I've done and some of it not, not published, we couldn't find any like biomechanical parameters that were predictive of, of, of a runner's perception of right. right. Like foot strike didn't matter. Um, right. You, you know, it's just the, the, some runners just seem to have a sweet spot with a certain shoe and other runners right. don't. And we, yeah, we went hunting for things to what could we what could but there was nothing right <laughs> we could find. I, because the problem is so much of that is perception and, and yeah. measuring somebody's perception is very difficult and there's a lot of mm. what that starts getting into the, like the cognitive component and that gets really difficult to measure right at oh. least you know so that's hard right it's hard to objectify this stuff yeah and then of course the the, the color comes into it as well <laughs> you know <laughs> You are totally right. I used to tell people like, don't worry about the color. Like when I when I was long ago before PT school, when I was working in running stores in uh, Portland, Oregon, I said, if you don't like the color, go run on the trails for a couple minutes while it's raining. You'll be brown. You'll be fine. But it's but true. The, it does affect it. Did, but did you? There was. I don't know whether you caught that research. It was one about three, three or four weks ago. It compared red orthotics to white orthotics. I saw and, that. I think you posted the, that. The, the color doesn't. Yeah, the color does matter. <laughs> it does. I saw that study. I'm like, man. I was telling people like, don't worry about the color, but I guess it does matter. Yeah. <laughs> red, red, red is uh, red is the winning color when it comes okay, to the color of psychology. To so on race okay. day, got to reach, got to re reach for the red Always ones. Always have red. Um, okay. So when we're talking. When we're talking about, let, let's ask the question to you, a, a, a runner, a good runner who's put on thousands of pairs of shoes. How quickly do you make your mind up about a shoe? And off the back of that, how quickly should we expect our patients, our athletes to decide whether a shoe is right for them? What should we be advising them on? You know, we said there's no breaking in time, but do you know a shoe is, is right for you? 
you know, first kilometer or does it take, you know, a bit longer? So my, at this point with the number of shoes I've tried, my body tends to be pretty sensitive to this stuff at this point where I can tell pretty early on if something's going to work or not. However, I still have been proven wrong several times where I'm going, you know what? I don't like this. I'm still going to get miles on it. And all of a sudden it just breaks. Like it just all of a sudden mile 30 is like, oh, this feels pretty good. Um, but again, my body is used to having a variety of stimuli all the time because I not only switch between shoes a lot, I also fortunately have the opportunity to test a lot of different things. So I have to be adaptable. Now, when it comes to people who aren't used to that, I would suggest at least a couple runs to give them time. But if the shoe is a big enough stimulus change, you got to ease into it. Like even if it feels good, ease into it. Because one of the things we do know is that really large shifts and changes are something that may predispose people to potentially injuries and stuff like that. Because again, it's just got to get your body used to it, right? And it's the same thing with training, right? If you go from running five miles a week to 100, chances are something's going to start to ache, right? Not for sure. Right? I'm sure somebody can do that. I'm sure there's always going to be exception to the rule. But I would, for most people, it's just breaking these into a, for a couple runs, at least to see if this is going to work well, which fortunately, there are some plenty of companies that do allow you to kind of get a couple runs in to really test this out. Not everybody has that opportunity, but at least a couple runs, give them a, give them a chance. But if, if it still is, isn't working out for you after like two or three runs, that might not be the best thing for you. So yeah, it's just interesting, interesting comment you made there, Matt. One, th one thing that I've noticed, especially with say, not, not necessarily the super elite athletes, but the really yeah. good runners yeah. and more, and more so the, the, the elite triathletes, they can put a running shoe on and not even take a step or take one step mm -hmm. and no, you know, like, but it, and it's, I think the more elite someone gets, they do seem to know pretty. And, right. And, I don't know whether you've ever noticed it. It seems to be more so with triathletes than runners, but um. <laughs> I've I've had the I've had the absolute wonderful um, opportunity to treat a lot of like high level professional and Olympic level uh, distance mm. runners uh, and a couple sprinters as well. And I have to say that that echoing that same thing, mm. the the elite elite seem to be seem to know exactly what to put on their foot. But mm. I think you're right. Is more so the triathletes, the elite among them, the, the one mm. or two that I've treated they seem to be very sensitive about what that and they seem to know their body super well which i guess when you train that hard all the time you have to but, need, but yeah but i agree with you it's interesting they don't often need, need to take a step in the shoe they just need to put right. it on and they seem to know right. it's, they just stand up in it and they're not, yeah. right <laughs> that no so that may be like then you have to ask yourself looking at your patient okay how experienced is this person right how how much time is it going to take for them to hmm. know that so it may be totally person dependent yeah. so but yeah, again the answer depends but wouldn't it be incredible to try and quantify what they what they are experiencing when they do that and then operationalize that and then do something with it but, yeah uh, that would be super interesting <laughs> i would not know where to start right now with that i'm like uh can you tell me a little bit more uh, <laughs> rather just throw I, I love your take on <laughs> i love your take there matt on on you know making sure that you know like you said two things you said early on in your opening talk uh, comments you said shoes don't really need breaking in anymore like they used mm -hmm. to and i totally agree you know you put on the vapor fly now it's like a right. long lost friend it's like a slipper right. you're, you're good to, you are good to go um but you also then says if something feels if something feels like a big change then be cautious because right. human tissue human tissues are sensitive to right. holidays or, or surprises and right. i've definitely had this experience recently with you put on the nike pegasus like a slipper you put on the vapor right. fly the next percent you put on the epic react just all beautifully comfortable shoes right. out the box and i put on the infinity react and a couple of steps in, a bit like our triathletes, Craig, I, there yeah. was something about it. It felt like a big change. I didn't know yeah. exactly how or why. And I was like, I just knew, I just knew, you know, 20, 20K today as a first run out right. of this shoe is a bad, is a bad idea. How do we, you know, with the inexperienced runner, because the experienced runners are already there. And yeah. they know that. A, lot, yeah. a lot of people we're seeing in our clinics may not fall under that. Yeah, yeah. How right. do we get this point across with the inexperienced runner? Should we be encouraging them to get a bit of a feel for, okay, this is the shoe you're in, even if you're not a shoe nerd like we clearly right. are, get a feel for its weight, its stack, and its drop right. as, a, as just three metrics. I'm, I'm you know, in fact, right. correct me if they're not the best yeah. three. That's but then yeah. when you change a shoe, when you change a shoe, take a look at how different those numbers are. Is that a reasonable starting point? 
I think I wouldn't focus so much on the numbers just because especially like heel drop, for example, example, we know that, that, that those measurements are not accurate at all because when you load that shoe, depending on where the person loads it, that number is going to totally change. However, the feel of it, I think you're totally on point. And I think part of this, when you're, when you're working with a new runner or somebody who's less experienced, it's, this is training. This is no different than any other treatment. Where we're trying to get them kind of more aware. So as a, you know, one of the things that as a, as a physiotherapist that I work on frequently is the body, the, somebody's proprioception, right? Go, are you aware of where your body is? Not to a paranoid level, but just going, hey, just kind of be aware of what's on your feet, right? If something feels like super off, this is something you need to be aware of, right? Because if you didn't tell them, they probably wouldn't have any idea. And again, that is part of the, the point of this website is to get people more aware of going, oh, this is why this maybe doesn't feel good, or maybe I should look at this. So I think it, it does become part of that training to go, okay, these are some of the things you might want to think about. Each person's different, but he, maybe you should think about if you found that like, you know, a higher or lower heel drop doesn't feel good, take some time to really think about that. Think about where does your foot feel like it's positioned, right? Do you like it? Do you not like it? How, how does that fit? Do you like the way your foot's being held? Do you not like it? Is anything pushing into you the, the wrong way you don't like? Part of that awareness is key so that they know that so they don't figure that out like three quarters of the way through a marathon and going, oh, this is really starting to hurt. I don't know, I don't know if I'm going to, if, if I'm going to uh, be able to finish this. So I think there's no one thing you can say. You just have to figure out, maybe ask them, go, is there anything that's important to you first? And then go off that and then go, hey, there's a couple other things you might want to think about. So I think you have to train them just like the elite athlete has been trained to know this, whether they know it intuitively or not, the, you're going to have to make them a little bit more aware because this is this is the most important piece of equipment that you have as a runner, right? This is the we're lucky that that's one of the few things we have to buy. Um, but yeah, it's part of making them aware. Yeah. If that makes we, sense. Sorry, can we yeah. just go back yeah. to breaking in shoes? Um, you know, yeah, I certainly agree. We don't need to do it. And yeah, I, I recall I recall a particular shoe um, back in the the uh, early '80s, the EB yeah. Bruising, that I used to run 100 miles a week in, and it, it's let's just say that the company that makes it actually still makes it. So I brought up here two years ago. I couldn't run. I couldn't even walk in them, <laughs> but that's what it used to, that, when it, but that's yeah. what it was like right. back then. Now I, I take your point about, and we've, but we've just had a, a little comment from Carly here about what it, yeah. I, I agree. We shouldn't really need to break shoes in, but we, you don't buy a new shoe today and to go and do a big long run in them tonight. No. So what would your advice be about breaking in? <laughs> You think know. about, you know what I should have said earlier, and I was thinking about this, it's not about breaking the shoe and it's about breaking your body in and yeah. ask, can your body adapt enough to that new stimulus? Yeah. That's really what it is. Yeah, no, that's not like not like 30 or 40 years ago. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, those shoes were 17 ounces. I know, I, I, I cannot, you know, we are so spoiled today with these like trainers that weigh eight or nine ounces compared to yeah. what, what they used to be. But that might also be why there's, there's a lot less people breaking 210 for the marathon now in the US than there used to be. So I don't know. <laughs> that might have been the secret. Cool. Running so, um, so just as a, just a, for the audience, just to summarize a bit of a clinical take home, pretty mm -hmm. reasonable when you've got a runner in front of you, regard, regardless of their level, uh, but, but, but more accurate, the, the more amateur they are, the more novice yeah. or new to running they are. Get a feel right. for what they like, what they don't like, what they've tried, what 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 speaks to them comfort wise, what work right. what has worked, what hasn't worked, etc. Right. Um, it, where does and I only I ask you this uh, just with your uh, DPT hat on. Where yeah. does injury come into the mix? So you know we're talking about talking about sort of guiding a, an uninjured runner to a shoe here. But what about right. the injured runner? Any special considerations here? Obviously, it totally depends on what their injury is, and I, the, the one of the cool parts is with the number, the amount of variety in footwear today. There are plenty of things that can allow that. I might suggest to go, hey, you know, if it's really bad, if it's really low dependent, like a stress fracture or, or a something that really needs time to heal. I have to admit, in my my younger clinical years, I would not. I would have been like, yeah, just get it back out as quick as you can. Now I really realize that some of this times this stuff does take time to heal, and you got to really really feel out where that person is so they don't re-aggravate and like reset themselves. But when it, depending on the, on what's going on, yeah, there's some cool stuff out there in terms of like the amount of rocker shoes out there has been awesome for unloading any kind of foot and ankle injury, but also on the other token for those people who love those shoes, I've had to go, Hey, just so you know, in a lot, in, in a lot of the research and my clinical experience, those rocker shoes do a great job of unloading the foot and ankle. 
that load has to go somewhere and that goes up mm -hmm. into the knee and hip. So this may or may not be a shoe you want to be in right now. You're going to have to test it out because each person's different, but just know that. And just on the other end, right? Somebody who's got, you know, if they're, th there's enough variety in shoes that you could facilitate different motions now, which is pretty cool. So if I, if, if somebody has got, you know, calves that don't move and I, they either aren't strong enough that they're guarding or there's like stiff and just, you know, a, a toe spring might help, help help them get into a normal terminal stance to be able to get over that four foot rocker. So yeah, you can totally use that in today's world with enough variety and the availability of shoes, even though they are expensive, to help facilitate that. But typically, if I can, I you know, if it's a bad enough injury, I, we're going to try to shut that down and get them to another sport for a little bit until I know that they can handle that load, and then I might make that suggestion on a different shoe. But again, try to make as little change as possible to that stuff. Unless I think it's that's a major issue. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think that's what's so great about the market at the moment. We just have yeah. that incredibly wide range uh, with yeah. different design features. Now, some of the some of the comments we've been making up till now have obviously we've been mm. talking a lot about elite athletes. Yeah. I mean, Adam, Adam here has just made a comment um, about that, you know, couch potato who wants to start mm. running 5K. Um, right. What, and they're not going to pay the sort of money that an elite athlete would want to pay, but right. what sort of advice, you know, what sort of advice would you give to look for in a shoe just in that, you know, and those that are not wanting to pay too much. Right. Things have absolutely gotten out of hand. I, I just, I cannot believe how expensive <laughs> shoes are. I'm like, I am so thankful I started this website so I can get free stuff to review. <laughs> but even when I have stuff that, that like that I want to test out, right? Like, so the Hyperion Elite from Brooks, I was like, I want to test this shoe out. And then 250 bucks later, I'm like, oh, well, my review is not going to be so hot right now. It, it hurts, man. This stuff's expensive. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously I'm biased having worked in the running industry and now being somebody who has a shoe website, right? So, but at the end of the day, we do know, so some of the unpublished research that I have from my undergraduate studies was that shoes actually break down at a fairly similar rate, regardless of price. And I have had a fair enough experiences of trying like, uh, the Nike zoom span was a, was an interesting shoe. that was like a supposed to be a cheap mild stability shoe. And I ended up loving it and letting it a heck of a lot more than their inline structure, which I'm not going to comment on that shoe. Um, just not my cup of tea. And yeah, I think it just, you can find stuff that's pretty good for a cheaper price. You just have to be willing to look a little bit. Um, there's plenty of stuff that you can find on sale, right? At this point, a lot of the models aren't changed enough. Sometimes they are, but most of the time not. But looking at the last couple of years should be totally fine to look at if you're if you're on a budget. But do try to get something a little bit better than your like, you know, big box store running shoe. Unless you're like, unless you're like, you know what, I'm just gonna I'm doing one five K and then I'm never gonna run again, then yeah, just go to like buy the cheapest that you can and get through it, right? Like that's gonna be fine. But it it is an investment at the end of the day. Right. So it's, if you are going to get into this, it is it is worth investing. Right. People who, who take up cycling will spend thousands of dollars or, or pounds or whatever currency you have on a bike. You should be able to spend a couple bucks on a pair, of, a decent pair of shoes. But again, again, remember, I'm biased. Right. So but, yeah. you know, there was a couple research studies that came out that demonstrate like uh, there was one that looked at like knockoff shoes from yeah. uh, Asia versus the inline ones. And they found that there was a drastic difference in like shock absorption and loading and biomechanics so, or kinematics. So it might be worth investing a little bit more. I'm going to take the middle ground on this. It's <laughs> worth investing a little bit more. Is it worth spending 200 bucks on a pair of shoes? Probably not. Get the ones that are like not get the ones that are still from the well-known companies, get the ones that do fit well and seem to ride well for you. However, whatever that is for you, but don't just, if you're going to start running seriously, don't just, grab the cheapest thing you possibly can make sure it fits well and if that means a couple extra bucks it's worth the investment because then you'll hate running less <laughs> i'm going to make sure my, i tune my wife in after the fact to listen to that comment because i've got a rack of about 45 shoes yeah 45 pairs of shoes not a single one of them was as cheap as 80 pounds i'll tell you that right now so <laughs> yeah I, I i agree i i've never understood the psychology of people that don't enjoy new shoes people say to me mm. oh i don't i don't want to get new shoes i, I don't I, I love i love new shoes there's nothing I and i buy every single pair almost yeah <laughs> so um okay cool so yeah. let me ask you a quick question in yeah. uh, you know historically you'd see mm -hmm. professionals clinicians uh, you know people that were air quotes experts 
Spotify. And when someone came to them with a shoe, mm-hmm. yeah, like someone came to them with a shoe, so they they'd scratch their chin and they they they'd show that how smart they were by picking up the shoe. I don't have one with me. They pick up the shoe and go, hmm, and they just flex it. <laughs> have you seen people do this? This kind of this that, shoe, this bending shoe test. Talk us through it. That's the worst thing you could. Buy. I mean, having worked in the running <laughs> industry like long ago, if you watch somebody come into the store and do that, the first thought was they have no idea what they're doing. So if you walk into a clinician's office and they bend <laughs> in the midfoot, right? There's there's no major joints in the sagittal plane in the midfoot, right? There's other 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 off axes, right? If you go and bend the shoe in the midfoot, first of all, you just create a flex point. Second of all, it shouldn't be bending there. So why like? Test the other parts. How well does it flex under the MTP joints, right? That would be a place that I would test it. But don't mess the shoe up. Like, I, I hated people that did that. So, yeah, you should probably grab your shoe and walk out <laughs> if they do that. Me too. <laughs> yeah. so, like, Craig, like, Craig so what do you think? I feel like we've like, talked about yeah. – we've talked – yeah, no, I, I, I you, you actually just reminded me, I, I used to, back in the days before PowerPoint, we had slides, I used yeah. to have a slide that said how to spot an expert. And <laughs> A, a, an expert was those person. That is that person who walks around at a conference with a box of slides mm-hmm. under their arms. But an expert is also the person that goes around the trade exhibits and bends shoes like that, or grabs a um, material and squeezes it between their fingers. Like I, I had this slide about all these ways to spot experts, and that that was one, <laughs> one of the ways, you Funny. know. <laughs> but it was being facetious, obviously. Yeah. yeah. So we can uh, we can park that uh, test yeah. appraisal method. Uh, I don't know what that about test is called, but don't do it. No. No, exactly. Let's not give it a name. Let's not make yeah. it a thing. We've yeah. talked a bit about weight, about stack, about drop. Um, we've talked a bit about ride. I want to talk mm-hmm. a bit about um, the upper in a second. But before I do, let's yeah. just quickly give a bit of credit to categorization. You know, the way we used right. to sort of very much say this is a racing flat. This is a neutral. This is a stability. And again, the market just feels different now. It feels like some shoes I, I look at and I, I just don't know where to put them anymore. And actually, some sho- I don't I don't look at that when I buy a shoe now. It's not mm-hmm. something I consider. I know a bit like yourself. I know what I like weight wise, right. comfort wise. I know the, I know the midsole I like. Like I know the drop I like, and I don't really look at the category anymore. Is that something you you give much attention to? You know, I, I still on uh, when we review a shoe, I still try to categorize it. But that's I think me just trying to be as organized as I can. It's really hard to do that because everything is seemingly blending together. Where I get shoes that are classified as stability, and my I my foot is all over the place. And then you get a shoe that's classified as neutral. I'm like, this thing like feels like it has a post in it, but it doesn't. So everything is blending together now. And I think that's why you have to like, you can, the the category might be a good place to start, but you have to take it with a grain of salt. And that's why getting it on somebody's foot is really, really important because at the end of the day, no matter what technology is in there, no matter what it's labeled as, it may, it's going to feel totally different from person to person. So I agree. Like the, the categories are all blending, right? You've got these shoes that are so light now today that like they're classified as trainers, but they're light enough to go race in, right? And if you ask anybody from 30, 40 years ago, if you gave them one of these shoes and go, this is a racing flat, right? And like, no, this is a trainer. It was like, right? Like the Vaporfly is a great example. Like it's so thick and cushion is light. And I'm like, I have, there's several of my, the people that I know that train full time in it because there's enough cushioning, but it is a racing flat. So mm-hmm. these categories are, they're all blending together now. Yeah, I think the way I like, I like to look at it is that we have a variety of design yeah. features that exist on a continuum. Right, and you can't categorize that. And if you look at that, um, the, you know the running that running the minimalist uh, index. Yeah. Um, you know, zero drop is classified as in the more minimalist end. Well, you know, hockers are down to four. You know, right. you know they've got the stack. Oh, oh. You know, so it, it's they're just design features that exist on a continuum, right. and that's the, the that's what it is. <laughs> right. The ultra paradigm is this massive thick soled shoe that has some yeah. interesting stability elements to that. That is definitely, I mean, it's zero drop, yeah. but I would not consider that a minimal shoe, but yeah. I've seen it classified well, as such. So I'm like, yeah, but that's what okay. I'm saying. That, that, that minimalist yeah, index. Exactly. Yeah. It, the, getting down towards zero is, is more minimalist. Well, no, that's right. not, yeah, it's, um, not at all. Yeah. Yeah. So again, it's, it's a great blending. point, though, to as, as human, as humans, we love to, subset things we love to categorize things it helps our thinking it helps you know our reasoning but actually you know if it's not no longer useful and clearly thinking about design features on continuums is and and then applying those to individuals is probably more useful than 
categorizing mm. feet and categorizing shoes and matching a with one and b with two right uh, but that's a, probably a, a different uh, discussion it is. let's talk yeah. about the upper Can, yeah because you know when whenever people talk to me about um whenever people have talked to me about shoes whenever people yeah. sort of just tell me what they like what they don't like athletes right the first thing they're always talking about the 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 mid the midsole i like this midsole right. i like this stack right. high. i like this drop i, I like p-backs i like you mm. know different materials TPU, and the upper, I like I, I think, so what yeah. about the yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like a carbon plate. I like a rocker right. geometry. Great, great. But then I, it has to be me that says, "What about the upper?" It's almost like, "Oh, right." right. That, I don't. <laughs> but I'm super, super fussy about the upper. I'm mm. super fussy. Like I know what I like, know what I don't, don't like, and it's not just durability or waterproof. But like, you know, I like the way it feels. Some of them annoy me. Some of them don't. Why doesn't the upper? I know you guys give the upper a lot of. I see yeah. your your roundtable discussion. You spend ages talking about the upper, and I. I I love it. Um, it's why are, important. Why yeah. are people talking more about the upper in general? That's a great question. I don't know. I know that you know some companies try to start marketing that more, but it seems like most of the marketing tech goes into the soul, right? That's why everybody's new technology is how the feel, the ride, what's going to make you faster. But it doesn't seem like people pay as much attention to fit, which is something that we talk about a lot, right? Because it's important, right? When I put my sh my foot in a shoe, not my shoe in a foot, uh, when I put my, my sh foot in a shoe, I want to know how it's going to hold my foot down, right? If I'm sliding over the upper or if it doesn't feel or it's putting excessive pressure on there, I'm not going to like that, right? I've had a number of shoes that like it, the thing is so stiff and tight, all of a sudden I'm getting paresthesias at the end of my toes and like my foots are going numb. And I'm like, that's not good, right? Is it, to anybody that ever asks, hey, my foot goes numb when I put this shoe on. Is that bad? Yeah, it's not good. So that's, you may need to change something. <laughs> so, but to, I don't know why. It, it's that, it's maybe people are just trying to find one thing to focus on, but it's like life. There, there's a lot of different components you gotta pay attention to. And for us, for myself, fit and how that thing feels on my foot is, is gonna be very important, right? Cause that's gonna tell me how many blisters I'm gonna have at the end of a, a race. Yeah, absolutely. And really? um, yeah. durability. Durability. I know you guys talk a bit about um, durability in your blogs as well. Again, yeah. I think we should, I think as clinicians, we should have a handle on this because we do, you know, we do, we are going to need to have these discussions. And if right. like we say, if we've got someone who we've got someone who wants to run a hundred kilometers a week versus someone that right. wants to run 10 kilometers a week, then obviously they're, they're different discussions to have. And, and right. everyone's got this historical reference point of i need to change my shoe at x kilometers could we right. just quickly speak to what your experience is with how accurate those those marketing uh, numbers are whether it's relevant or do we just go on feel how, how do we gauge durability of a shoe so again one of the unpublished studies i did when i was in my undergraduate was comparing all these different shoes and seeing at what point did the midsole start to break down and the mechanics start to change and what we found was it didn't matter how expensive the shoe was, everything seems to break down around 100 miles-ish. And then after that is how well your body can compensate that determines how long, how long you can keep that shoe for. So you've heard of that person that brags on social media going, oh, I've had this shoe and it's lasted me a thousand or like 100,000 miles. Like, okay, that's great. Mm -hmm. The industry standard of three to 500 miles obviously varies. There are some shoes that shred to pieces far faster than that. There are other ones that last longer than that. It does come down to the individual combined with the shoe, right? Different shoes are lasting different amounts of time. I think as things are getting lighter and lighter, I'm seeing a lot of those outsoles start to get destroyed after short miles compared to the stuff from 20, 30 years ago when you're like, oh, this is a tank. Like it, this will last, this will last longer than I will. So it, it, again, it, it depends. And I, I think the three to 500 mile is, a nice starting point but people are going to have to to really feel that out and some and i used to tell people you know what when you start getting a little more banged up and achy it's time to change your shoes out but then people would tell me oh you know like i got through this rough patch and everything feels awesome so it really it's very person specific to figure out okay when when should i get a new pair of shoes when you start chewing through the outsole or the uppers like your foot's busting through the upper that's probably about when it's time and it's going to depend on how aware you are I'm very sensitive to that. And I've always been somebody who at like two to 300 miles or so I'm like, okay, I'm starting to get a little beat up. It's time to change the shoe out. And fortunately now I have a website that now enables me to do that even better. But yeah, it's, it's going to be person dependent. Um, and to be fair, a lot of the people that I know who have, you take their shoes to a thousand plus miles, even though I tell them don't, do have a larger injury, uh, like injury history. So 
some people can do that. Some people can't. My suggestion is you have, you honestly have to learn your body, but I would, uh, the industry standard is not totally accurate, right? It depends yeah. on the person. I, I think your point's perfect in that a lot of these things, people would love it if they looked to us as the clinicians for the answers, but you've got to learn your body. You've got to learn right. what works for you. And it, right. I know it feels very gray in a world where people yeah. want that and why, but it, it is what it is. I see, so, is. You know, I see so many athletes and, and patients now who say to me oh i got the vapor fly because i heard about all the four percent stuff and right. um, it's completely shredded to pieces like after 80k i was like of course it has you're not supposed to be doing your long run like it, it, right you're, it's you're not supposed to be running show, 100 so, you know uh, yeah you're not supposed not... to be running 60 miles in that but <laughs> they do so um, exactly crack it out yeah crack it out four times a year for the pb right right um i mean that's what the elite okay do. so um yeah yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's, uh, while we've, we've talked a lot about sort of how we appraise shoes, which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about them more. I just want to ask, uh, get a yeah. few uh, sort of personal personal questions mm. from you, yeah. uh, if that's okay. That's um, okay. What, uh, what do you look for in a shoe? What's your favorite shoe? What's your favorite shoe of all time? And and do you oh. do you practice as you preach with, I mean, you wear lots of shoes for review, but yeah. your, your training, not when you're reviewing, but your training, right. do you have a favorite? Do you have a rope? a trusty rotation how does it work so um i'd say probably one of my favorite shoes of all time right now is the uh the recent sketchers uh gomeb speed elite hyper uh that is a little bit biased since i may or may not have had a hand in uh how that was created i can't say that for sure um but that's probably <laughs> one of my favorite flats and like workout shoes that i that i utilize currently um gosh favorite I don't know if I have like an absolute favorite trainer at the moment. Um, that's hard because I think you go through so many, many, but for me, what I tend to like more is a firmer shoe, not necessarily a stability shoe, but a shoe that's a little bit firmer, particularly in the forefoot. And that's one of the reasons why I, got, I like the Speed Elite Hyper is because the design of the plate acts almost as posts in a, in a manner because they're so far they're extended out beyond the foot so for me i need a lot of i my body tends to work very well with good forefoot stability or like that stable shoe up front and that that plate and the design just works super well for my mechanics and i've run five caves to marathons in that shoe um that shoe was on my feet in my first marathon that my fiance signed me up for two weeks so she was tired of me complaining about getting slow because i was working so much um, at the LA marathon and that thing, I did not think it was going to be able to do it, but it did. And that's what it was designed for. So, um, mm. yeah, a firmer ride is definitely because to me, that's, that's more stable and that doesn't mean having a post. Um, and then something that the upper is thin enough that I don't feel it, but not so thin that I start tearing through it. So I think I still have like having been one of those ex people who was like Mr. Barefoot minimalist guy, I don't do that anymore, but I still think that I'm, heavily influenced like that where a little less shoe tends to work a little better for me. So yeah, firmer, faster. Perfect. We should probably just, we should probably just give a quick shout out to your fiance. Yeah. Um, and we shouldn't sleep on the fact that she's highly likely to be in Tokyo next year. If yeah. assuming the Olympics go ahead. Um, and we, I've just got to say as well, um, if you have future children, that that stock that stock <laughs> in future mini athletes that I'm absolutely <laughs> buying up from the start. Okay. <laughs> She she is the they true are, athlete. I'm like destined I, to be runners. Yeah, I have been, I, we're not going to push them that way, but uh, it's whatever they want. But she is such an amazing athlete. So it's, <laughs> we we met through running, and then uh, when we started dating, it was like I started pacing her through all of her workouts before she qualified for Olympic trials. She's like, "Who's this guy?" And so it's been. I still that's my main. That's my set. My third job is uh, is pacing her through all of her workouts, which is qu quite fun. Except when she gets mad at me if I do if I pace her wrong so <laughs> she is amazing she's awesome <laughs> and she she takes your advice on shoes 100 percent of the time i'm assuming uh no she does <laughs> she does and doesn't she appreciates the the influence but at the end of the day she's got a she i'm the one who finds her the good deals on like ebay and stuff like that or can find her the stuff that she really really wants so all the vapor flies she has are from me so um it's she takes my advice but as always it's, it's person dependent so i'm going to say hey this might work well for you but how does this feel on your foot so she has to give me that feedback and she doesn't want to give me the feedback yeah. she just wants to be told what to do and i'm like no you need to tell me because it's not my foot yeah mm -hmm. yeah um and of course, of course I know she's my I, fiance uh, as well so she doesn't listen to me most of the time anyway so that that's part of being engaged there, there we go that's, right? that, that's yeah 
at one one hundred percent. I know you've seen a lot of uh, mas masters athletes, mm -hmm. uh, clinic, you know, clinical practice. I, or at yeah. least I, I, I'm sure I read or heard somewhere that you see yeah. a lot of masters athletes, and I'm very very aware that unfortunately I'm now considered a master as is Craig. Um, I think it's 35 or is it 40? Either way, we're both North of there. Um, yeah. And you've also noticed some, um, I was, I was listening to your recent, your recent round table. I think it was, yeah. the, it was the um, speed elite hyper one where yeah. you briefly were talking about carbon plates. And then you talked about mm. how you'd noticed a bit of a relationship between problems propping up in uh, cropping up, sorry, in masters athletes with certain design features right so when the vaporfly first came out so i was doing my orthopedic residency at casa Colina, which is a great a great facility in uh claremont and pomona in southern california and claremont is a very well-off area and so we'd see a lot of masters athletes from that area getting back into running and wanting wanting to be as they were in their the southern california southern california is a hotbed of, of high school distance running and people are insanely fast here so a lot of the people that go through that get older want to get back to it they, are, they come back as fast as they can. They want all the newest technologies. And a lot of people were jumping into that shoe as fast as they could. And I was seeing all kinds of injuries from jumping into something they're not used to, right? So the carbon fiber plate, we know from a lot of the recent research that there is an optimal amount of stiffness that works uniquely to each person, right? So Jared Ward's group, uh, I think it was like McLeod et al. was the article um, that demonstrated that, yeah, it's, it's different for every person. So if that plate is too stiff, right that's going to put forces through some odd areas so normally for somebody that has like a, they um like a, a stiff mtp joints and they can't get that normal 60 degrees or whatever you need for of extension of those joints to be able to get your get over that foot i would have suggested a rocker shoe or sometimes something with a plate to kind of facilitate that but it seemed like the combination of the super soft sole combined with how stiff that plate was for certain people in the population just was not a good combination i saw a good amount of stress fractures in the forefoot and the metatarsals. I saw a good number of like, of, like I saw a couple like flexor houses, longest strains and different like irritations there. So as always, I think the biggest note for people is there is no such thing as a magic shoe, right? And you have mm -hmm. to pay attention to that, especially with today's advertising, right? The Socrates Endorphin Pro that's coming out right now that everybody's loving. That's a great shoe, right? I like that more than the, the, the Vaporfly. However, just because the majority likes it doesn't mean it's gonna work for every person. Just because there's a bunch of marketing behind it doesn't mean it's gonna work for every person. That's where knowing your own body and going, is this gonna work for my big biomechanics comes into play. There are people that when they put on the Vaporfly run slower, right? It's not a magic shoe. It just happens to work some, what would some would consider magic for a certain population, but not all of them. So just like any new stimulus, you gotta figure out, is this gonna work for you? And if it's starting to bug your feet, right? That's a problem. So a lot of a lot of like forefoot issues is something that I was seeing. Um, a lot of hamstring issues because you know it puts it, it load changes right. So people aren't used to how that shoe transitions. Lots of hamstring irritation, especially people that have like those old middle distance runners or distance runners that had hamstring tendinopathy for years, and it quiets down. They're like oh, I've got the vapor fly, and all of a sudden it flares up again. I don't want to make blanket statements and say that if you've had that, that's going to happen again, but. If you're going into anything new and you've had injuries in the past, you may need to take those transitions a little bit slower and really figure out, is this the best possible thing for me? Because yeah, it may make you run fast for one race, but then if you're injured and you can't train, that screws everything up. So there's no such thing as a best or, you know, super shoe. It's just person dependent. Yeah. Actually, and that's clinical. Thing, yeah. Yeah. Just, just, just sort of following on from that a little bit. One thing that it's always struck me is the faith that, runners put in advice from fellow runners mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it's quite extraordinary and I, I i i won't share it but there's the study by um oh oh sorry i've just got it here in front of me now sorry um walton and french in which yeah. they looked at where runners got their advice from and they sort of concluded that runners were more trusting of running shoe stores that have a treadmill than they were of health professionals which i found a little scary um, they were very, very more trusting. They, they were more trusting of other, uh, yeah, yeah, that kind of advice. But, but what I'm leading up to, and I just want to, I'll just share, I'll just share this one here. This is um, my my search engine keyword tool, and I've just randomly picked the Essex um, Keanu. And yeah. what this is saying is that the in Google, Essex Keanu review is searched for an average average of six thousand times a month. So that's 
that's just that running. That's not people searching. Right. That's true. That's people searching for a review on that particular right. model, let alone all the other shoes. So it, it, it is quite extraordinary, I think, just how, um, how, how many runners put faith in reviews. Yeah, they do. And, and yeah, a lot of what we've been talking about is that, well, you know, what works for you doesn't necessarily work for me. Um, but there's a, there's a there's a lot of search engine traffic looking for reviews on different running shoe models, yeah. which is I'm sure is great for your website. <laughs> <laughs> it is right. We don't make that much money off there. What little money go, happens usually goes to those other two to pay for like <laughs> any, anything that would like in terms of like equipment and stuff like that. But yeah, it's people. The reviews really come, and it doesn't matter if you're a medical professional or not. It seems I think that my the having that as a background has not made a ton of difference for the majority of population, right? So we are still considered just as trustworthy or not trustworthy as, as anybody else. So that's why making sure the quality of the information that we're presenting is as, as good as we can and as objective as we can. So it's intense. And that Keanu is probably going to go up again because the new one's coming out right now. Yeah. No, but I just, whenever I look at those kinds of numbers, yeah. I think, oh, wow, you know, that the people really, and they're putting faith in these reviews. And, and Yeah, they you know, are. And that's why these get, companies send us stuff for free. <laughs> <laughs> we're marketing. We do, basically. and when we go off, we're, we're, after we've come off live, I am going to yeah. bend your ear about how to get more free stuff myself. But okay, all yeah. joking aside, we we know that people respect your blog, and mm -hmm. you know we're we're all oh, members so. of the running shoe the running shoe yeah. geeks um, Facebook group, and right. it's very well respected in there. People often refer to it in there. Do you think you may not know the answer to this? Do you think people? respect you guys because you are you know dpts or because you're all runners and pretty good runners at that or do you think it's a nice blend of the two i think to be honest with you given the fact that how many questions every day we get is what's a dpt we're like okay like we should just say physiotherapist <laughs> uh, but given the number of times that people ask us that i think that people are more interested in the fact that we're runners i think I don't yeah. think people know yeah. that until they get to the website and realize that we are actually people in the medical field. That so they look like, oh, oh, okay, I didn't know that. We even know what they don't even know what our the like the uh, acronyms behind our yeah. name mean. Hmm. Uh, this is why I'm trying to get faster so that people <laughs> respect my opinion more. Yeah, <laughs> it does help, I guess. Yeah. Got nothing to do. Yeah. Nothing to do with certificates. Um, yeah. Absolutely. We are getting to the business end, uh, yeah. the bottom of the ninth, uh, you know, yeah. whatever you want to call it. And um, yeah. I just I wanted have to, to head out here close up by asking, my, asking. My, my, I, have, I have a patient here, so let, I'm going to have to head out here some... pretty quick. So, yeah. Sure. Cool. So la last yeah. question. I know on your yeah. on your round tables, what I love at the end is you guys say you're reviewing a shoe and you all say if this shoe was a pizza, what pizza would it be? Or if this shoe was, you know, and, and it's just a bit of fun at the end, I, yeah. you know. I'm just going to throw this one on you. It's, it's a sort of question on, on, on those lines between yourself, Nathan and David. I've just uh, finished watching uh, the Michael Jordan documentary. If you guys are the Chicago Bulls, who who's who's MJ, who's Scotty Pippin, who's Dennis Rodman? <laughs> Uh, biased, biased answer. That well, I, my my <laughs> assumption. This is gonna make me sound like a jerk, but I'd say I'm I'm Michael Michael M J just because I'm the O G of this website. But um, <laughs> I would say David's probably Scotty Pippen, but that's just a guess. <laughs> I don't want to cause arguments between you guys. I have just, no yeah. idea. That's a good question. They are always better. I, there's a reason why I wait until last to answer those questions. I'm sitting there going, I, I know, have just... no idea. I'm still yeah, trying yeah. to figure it out there. And they'll tell me a week beforehand. <laughs> It'll take me a week, and it's still up until the last second. To go, oh, gosh, what am I going to say? <laughs> cool. Well, um, yeah, I just want to say thanks so much. I could talk shoes with you all night long, but I know you got paid. Yeah. I know you got patience, but um, yeah. yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you yeah. guys so much for having me. Again, yeah. I have to let everybody know here that that both Craig and Ian have been, whether they know it or not, have been extremely influential on my career and uh, interest and also the PhD. It's like, you know, Craig's website, The Running Research Junkie, is something I, I still like. You haven't been updating it, I don't think, as much. Uh, but, I've, yeah. well, I've, I've got something big coming out soon on that. Okay. <laughs> but it's, it, it's something that inspired me to start asking these kind of questions that led to the development of, of the website I have and also to do this PhD to go, you know what? Let's see if we can find better answers. And you know what? Trying to find better answers is really hard. It's really hard. Yeah. You're probably like me, Matt. You used to know what you <laughs> well, well, I'm hearing here. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah. The, the more I go into like clinical practice and the more I look at the research, the more I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> but that's part of clinical mastery is that the, the more uh, you, know, you really know it's more complicated than that. 
Yeah. I'm reading between the lines here that Craig is basically Phil Jackson. Have I got that yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. On that, on, that, on that note, look, yeah. thanks so much, Matt. Um, for those that have just joined us, come back soon. It'll be yeah. rendered on Facebook. This video will be up on YouTube um, later on today, my time. So, look, thanks again, Matt. <laughs> yep. Thank you guys very much. Have a good one.